Welcome to Stories That Stick, Stick, a podcast series about the stories that shape us. All comes back down to, again, our identity as souls, as human beings. And if I can contribute to that, then I would be very, very happy. Hey guys, it's Ade here, your host for Stories That Stick. Welcome to season two. I'm not sure why we're calling it season two, because to be honest, it's no different from season one where we interview amazing UK black individuals making a positive impact within our community. So, I had the pleasure of speaking with Sheila Nortley, an award-winning filmmaker who lets us know why Anansi the Spider, Asata Shakur biography, and listening to her parents speak about their upbringing in Ghana made a huge impact in her life. And we speak about how she would like to be remembered and the impact that she is making within the community. Now, if you're a brand new listener, welcome. But please know we start every conversation speaking about death. So if this is triggering, then please do skip ahead approximately one minute and a half or when you hear the page turning sound effect. And, oh God, this is embarrassing. But throughout the interview, I was calling Sheila Shayla because one of my best friends who's practically a sister to me, her name is pronounced Shayla and it is written Sheila. So unconsciously, I kept on referring to Sheila as Shayla, and she never corrected me until the very end. Please do forgive this faux pas, um, but this should not detract from the quality of the interview. Well, I hope not anyway. So yeah, sit back, relax, and here's Sheila Nortley. Shayla, how are you? Happy New I'm Year. I'm very by well, the way. thank you. Happy, Happy New Year, Ade. Happy New Year. So I start with an interesting question. It's the question that surrounds <clears throat> death. Okay. How do you feel about death as a subject? <laughs> I think it's an inevitable part of life. Like it's um it's just part of the cycle of everything. So I'm comfortable with it. Do you have that in the forefront of your mind though? Do you know what? I think I do, but not in a morbid way, just in a way that it's just such a reality and reflecting on the fact that, you know, we're not going to be here forever gives a sense of accountability and purpose regarding legacy and what one wants to leave behind. Mm. Yeah, let's actually ask this. If you, God forbid, but you did pass, what would you want people to say about you and more specifically your work? Regarding my work, I would want people to see it as a representation and a reminder of the humanness, the humanity of black people, and hopefully a reminder of the value of our lives, you know, and that we are human beings, not just kind of these others that exist within contextualized realities, I suppose. And you want people who see your work for them to build empathy because i guess the follow-up question would almost be who's the audience because as black people we know our worth well we, i would we like don't. to think a lot of us <laughs> a lot of us do a lot of us don't um but for example i think you'd be familiar with the concept that when it's a white story on the screen it's a universal story so you can watch i don't know like bridget jones diary and it's a story about a woman and her kind of comedic quest for love kind of thing. It's, it's a story for everybody. However, when you put a black character, it becomes a black story. story. It becomes, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? So it's just about like, um, just having that platform. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah. So the through line is just being human. Yeah, just being human, just being allowed to exist. Well, let's then talk about your existence and story so far. And the way I normally do that is by starting with our first chapter. So that's okay. zero to ten. Shayla, who was little Shayla? <laughs> <laughs> from zero to ten. Paint some stories for some pictures. So from zero to ten, I... Hmm. Gosh, obviously it's hard to remember like the earliest times, but generally I was pretty much a very happy child. I had my two big sisters and my younger sister, my parents, and that was like my close unit. But then I also had a really close wider family. So cousins coming around all the time and playing with them. 
Um, but I was brought up in a really loving environment. Mm. Where are you from? I'm from Ghana, West Africa. Were you born Originally. there? No, I was born here in London. So you're first generation. Yeah. Or your parents gen- born here as well, were they? No, no, my parents migrated from Ghana. So yeah. I'm, Do you know why? My sisters. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, my dad is a doctor and he came over here and started building his career. I think just being honest at the time, you know, there were a lot more opportunities over here and obviously financial stability and security. So I think, um, yeah, he just made that decision to come along with my mum and my two sisters who were born in Ghana. So I was the first one that was born here. Yeah, yeah no, that's very typical of immigrant parents. They go to passes new in order to have, quote unquote, a better life for themselves yeah. and their family. So, yeah, I understand that. And what were the uh, sort of ways you were playing? So... What's really interesting is, and it's my mum that brought this to my attention, it was, for me, always about storytelling. So I would create little theatre plays in my front room and I would have my, um, my, especially my younger sister, like I'd get her involved. She would act out pretty much all of the characters and my cousin. Um, and I would just create these stories and basically found myself directing them. Then I'd call my parents in, be like, okay, the show's ready. And then they would literally watch and perform and then I'd send them off so I could work on like act two. So they'd have an interval and I'd be like, hey, like come back in like half an hour and then I'd create a second part. So your imagination ran wild. but You were like, you know what, I'm actually going to make it into reality. And then you roped your little sister in. But you know what's interesting, Ade, is that when I got older, like as you said, like towards the latter part of that decade, like 9, 10, 11, especially yeah, 10, 11, you know, as you're approaching puberty and adolescence is you know you're going to start getting into that stage of your life I found storytelling as a means of expressing myself because I became very very shy during that period Mm, understood but I still want to stay on zero to ten the first chapter if that's okay just ever so slightly so as a black woman yeah were you aware that you were black I was because um, I grew up in Mitcham and the Mitchell Morden area, which was at the time significantly white. So very early, I was aware that I was different to like all my friends at school. But again, because I had such a big family and so on, like coming home from school, I was surrounded with my culture and my family and black people. So I felt comfortable in who I was and I didn't have any shame about being African or not being English. That's something that's really quite key, isn't it? The fact that, yes, outside the four walls, you're receiving all of this sort of vitriol hate or racist remarks. But when you come in, there's that safe haven and the empowerment and the knowledge of being great in a sense, right? Yeah, definitely. And something that I'm just realising now actually speaking to you is that even before moving on to the next chapter, I started to realise in school in terms of beauty and I guess those kind of things that um, white was seen as, uh, you know, that those were the pretty girls in school. Those are the girls that people liked more. And I think racially, that was probably my first racial lesson, actually. Yeah. And then did you ever go home to your parents and speak about such issues? Um, was there any conversations? No, there was no conversation. No, there was culture? no conversation. There was nothing really like that. I don't, like, it wasn't a massive deal for me, if I'm going to be honest. It yeah, was a sure. very, yeah. So it wasn't something I kind of came back and said, oh, this happened or that happened. It was just like, oh, okay, that's interesting. They were probably having their own battles in regards to race and racism within their own workplaces as well. So this decade, what I am picking up, and please correct me if I am wrong, is that genuinely it was fun-filled and <laughs> just genuinely using storytelling as a way to build one's sense as far as I'm aware of. Was that fair to say? Yes, that's correct. Well, we will move on to your next chapter, which is going to be 11 to 20. But before we do, and for those who are coming to this podcast brand new, What I tend to do with all my guests is just get them to fill out a very, very brief questionnaire before we record. And the questions literally is, what was the funnest story you read or were told as a child, a teenager and an adult? And for the child, you wrote Anansi the Spider, I assume, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so <laughs> why was this a fun memory? And for those who don't know about Anansi, give us a synopsis and specifically why it held such a fun place in your in your childhood. Yeah. So Anansi is a Ghanaian fable about a spider who's very cunning and tricky and gets into all kinds of mayhem. And he's been around for I don't even know how many generations. The reason why it's a fond memory is because I remember when I made my first trip back to Ghana as a child, I was fascinated with the way the, in which this story was told. So the story of Anansi and the calendar. We sat down Anansi in the kind of front yard of my grandfather's house and her auntie sat all the children down and just told us these very magical stories. All the wisdom in the world and he puts them into this calendar. Through her eyes, through her hands, through her intonation. But as he's climbing the tree, she just created a world that was far more deep than I could ever have seen on a TV screen. Ends up dropping the calabash bowl and it falls to the ground, smashes, and that's how we all have a little piece of wisdom within us. So I felt very connected with my ancestry and very connected with my culture. Mm, Well... Let's then go into your next chapter, which is the following decade, from 11 to 20. Wow. This decade, (laughs) I lie. Yeah, that one's a mad one. (laughs) It is so mad because fundamentally the education (laughs) system plays a huge role and at the end of this decade, we're meant to be a full-fledged adult, right? Contributing yeah, to- it's the education system, it's hormones, it's like just so much happening between you being a child and you becoming an adult. We're still in Mitcham, I assume. Yeah, still in Mitcham. So transitioning into secondary school, um, I became incredibly shy, is a nice way to put it. An honest way to put it would be insecure. And when I moved to secondary school, they banded you into different tiers based on your ability. And I was in an extension class, which meant, unfortunately, there were not many black people in my class. There was only one other black person in my class. And at that age as well, where you are becoming a young woman, you start to look at things like beauty and feeling pretty and so on. And yeah, I didn't feel that way. So what did make you feel that way? Or was this not in this decade? But I'm hoping that you do feel beautiful because you are beautiful. But I was wondering, well, what made that switch for you? I don't think during that decade I felt beautiful. But what I did feel was towards the middle of that decade, when I was about 14 years old, two things happened. One, they started to mix up the classes as we got into GCSE. So I was able to make friends who I shared more with culturally. I was able to expand my social circle mixed with more black kids in my school. And that was one thing that happened. And second of all, my older sister had begun to take an interest in Pan-Africanism. So she was attending all of these courses, reading all of these books, and that began to filter down to me. So as I was still in my formulative years, I was able to start really appreciating and getting into black history. I was reading like Malcolm X autobiography, Asata Shaka autobiography, Robin Walker and um, the Benin uh, Empire. And all of this gave me a really useful foundation in my formative years, which I think didn't make me feel beautiful, but made me feel important and made me feel like um, a sense of love for who I was as a black young lady. So whilst you're in the education system, right, because we're in secondary school here, what were you thinking in insofar as career? Were you gravitating towards any subjects? Yeah, English. I loved, again, like just the written word and stories and being able to communicate. And again, because I'd been so shy to speak, I found poetry as well was a, a great way of expressing my thoughts. And that now that I had a, an interest in regards to black history, Um, I would use my poetry to explore some of my thoughts and feelings about how we could use history to like shape a better future for ourselves. So everything was starting to kind of come together in that sense. Um, But it was definitely a passion for storytelling. And did you continue the the tradition of getting your parents to sit around and hear you? No. (laughs) (laughs) No, by this stage, 
you know, it's like by my teenage years now, I was doing poetry events um, when I was like 16, 17. In fact, you know what? The first time I stood up and did poetry, I was 15 years old and I went with my two sisters to this poetry event. There was this woman there. She was an old lady, really, really beautiful, like silvery hair. She was so beautiful. She looked so beautiful. And I read my poem. And when I left the stage, she called me aside and she said, how old are you? And I said, 15. And she said, what a beautiful age. And she said, when you grow older, I see your name in lights. I see your name engraved in the future. I asked her her name and she said her name was Rose. And when I grew older, I actually have as part of my first tattoo, I had a rose to remember that woman and what she kind of had spoken into my life at, at that young age. And bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? Honestly, you just never know what will change the trajectory of someone's life with the words in which you say. Yeah, I'm sure definitely. Rose, unbeknownst to her, didn't realise the impact that that had on you. And I am seeing how English and a love of language, poetry, and also Pan-Africanism that was sort of passed down through your older sister. Now are we thinking you want to do what with this? Were you thinking being a poet was a career choice or profession? No, no. Being a poet was an outlet for me to like express some of my thoughts. And um, that was what that was about. In terms of career path, my parents knew that I was not going to be a doctor. <laughs> um, so like the, the plan was, what else could I do that was, you know, um, a viable and safe choice? My dad was thinking maybe I could be a, a lawyer or something like this. And then obviously by the time I got to GCSEs, I was really enjoying English. And I chose that for A-level and then eventually started that for a degree. So I was looking at maybe being an English teacher or something like this. Right, to be an English teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? Let's get into where we find you, which is the last chapter for the way we do it with stories that stick. Mm -hmm. But again, it'll be remiss of me not to ask you to expand on a story or one of the funnest stories you read as a teenager. Do you remember what you wrote? Yeah, Sata Shakur. Yeah, please give us, not a synopsis, give us an overview on why that made an impact or had an impact during this decade. I, I really love the way you've asked these questions because now that you've asked the questions, I can see why that was so impactful. I was obviously at a point in my life where I was discovering who I am, who I wanted to be, what my purpose was. And again, having grown up in quite a, a white like school system, I was rediscovering my roots. And someone like Asata Shakur, she she was, she is just like to me the epitome of freedom. She was so brave and so bold and had such integrity to fight for what you believe in. Mm. And that's what she did. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's start talking about fighting for what it is you do believe. And I assume that's what you are doing, especially with your career. So let's go into your third chapter, which is 20 plus. So we're catching yeah. you at the tail end of university with an English degree. What's yeah. going on, <laughs> Shayla? How are we looking at cultivating the person you are? today okay so this is um the easiest part to record because it's relatively fresh compared to some of the rest of it so i didn't finish my english degree i didn't enjoy studying english literature at university which so I, um, I was at queen mary at first so i changed to a media and communication degree at Brunel university and there i met quite a few people who were studying similar courses in fact in my last year at uni i shot a short film called the hydra what's that about so it was a neo-noir short film using the codes and conventions of American film noir on a black British context. <laughs> yeah. You kind of throwed me with those because I feel like that's industry speak. It was oh, my a bad. Okay. neo so, noir. Okay, go. Yeah. So film noir. Yes. All right. So film noir was a type of film that like everyone's familiar with, even if they don't know what it's called. It's kind of like um, 1930s, um, you know, it was dark, too dark, like that kind of film. So that film um, was shot with um, two friends, Nosa Igbenadian and Shola Amu. We shot that film, put it into some festivals and it won some awards. So what was it, or maybe it probably hasn't 
appeared, but I like to think it has, where you were like, you know what, I'm definitely doing what it is I aim to do. I'm definitely making the stories I wish to tell. Was there a defining mm. moment for you? Yeah, 2013. Um, so basically in 2012, we shot a film called Sable Fable, which was a, like a really independent film. The director, Stephen Lloyd Jackson, we shot this film with minimal crew, minimal budget, minimal everything. We just shot it. He submitted into festivals. In 2013, we found ourselves at the American Black Film Festival, which is one of the biggest film festivals. And we were nominated for four awards. We won two of them, one being Best Film. And it was Spike Lee who gave us the award. And it was like, oh my God, this is real. People enjoy what we do. Well, we're pretty much at the stage where I kind of just want to open the floor to you. Is there anything that we haven't discussed about not only the work you do, but what you hope to do? You know, it's interesting because you started with legacy. And I think that's probably what all of this leads to, you know, from chapter one, chapter two and chapter three. It's all been a, a search for who I am, what I want to do, what I want to tell, and then what I hope my work is remembered for, my contribution to the wider narrative. And it all comes back down to, again, our identity as souls, as human beings. And if I can contribute to that, then I would be very, very happy. And before I do let you go, you did write one of the funnest stories that you read or were told as an adult was stories about your parents and grandparents. Yeah. Any yeah, it particular just... story? You know what's interesting? There's not a particular story, but it's the magic that happens when my parents speak about these things, you know, like... There is a life that re-enters their eyes when they remember what feels like a, a lifetime ago. If I ask my mum about funny incidents, because she's a twin and she's got lots of funny stories about her and her twin as children in Ghana. When I ask my dad to speak about his father or his mother, it's like this young energy, this young spirit just enters them both. You know, it's like colour just enters their world again. And yeah, it's just it's just the magic of memory. So yeah, that's that's been um it's been it's always a beautiful experience. Well, the way I end all my interviews is with this one question. If you can gift one book to your loved ones what book would it be and why mm. um the secrets of divine love it's just a very beautiful insightful book reminding us of our purpose i think something like that would be good for everyone because everyone has a different way of expressing that purpose and manifesting that purpose but it's just a reminder to look within and not get caught up i suppose in all the madness that's happening around us and so, Shayla, how can we find you in the World Wide Web? And when we do, <laughs> what would you like us to do? My website is www.sheilanortley.com and my Insta handle is at Sheila Nortley. I've also very recently joined Clubhouse, again, at Sheila Nortley. I don't know how I'm going to, yeah, if I'm going to be on there much. I don't really know how to use it yet, but that's where you can find me if you're on Clubhouse as well. And what can you do? I mean, from a perspective in terms of my work, if that you see things on there that you like, obviously just sharing and, and engaging with me, um, letting me know your thoughts and things. Every time I get a, a message, um, whether it's a DM, a comment, a like, I do um, appreciate just that interaction, that engagement and that support. Sheila, it's been an absolute pleasure, really and truly has. And guys, please do get in touch with her. Do check out all of her work. I will put what we've mentioned in the show notes as per usual. And if there's anything that we can do better, please let us know because we're always trying to improve. Thanks very much for listening and stay tuned for another episode of Stories That Stick. Sheila, take care. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, please do share it. And 
If you'd like to be featured on the podcast, please do get in touch. I've been saying Shayla, and the reason why I've been saying Shayla is because one of my best friends, albeit yeah. she's Spanish, it's spelled Shayla, but it's Sheila. You pronounced it Sheila, and you never corrected me. I thought it was an accent. I thought maybe you had an accent. <laughs> no, no. correct me from I'm the I'm so top. sorry. That's I just thought you had an accent in the way okay. you pronounced my name. <laughs>